This is a review of Unit 1 of AP U.S. Government and Politics entitled Constitutional Underpinnings. The roots of American democracy stem back to the writings of early British political thinker John Locke. Locke emphasized his idea of natural rights, that some rights were just fundamental to humans and could not be superseded by man-made law. He outlined this in some of his famous works, including the two treatises of government. Many of the principles of democracy that we hold dear today come from the ideas of thinkers like Locke. Theories such as the consent of the governed, the majority rule, the fact that government should respond to its people through the rule of law, and that the government has powers that should be limited. With many colonists agonizing over what to do in their relationship with the British, it took the work of a former British immigrant named Thomas Paine to convince many that independence was the best measure. Paine secretly printed in a pamphlet entitled Common Sense, in which he argued against British colonial rule and encouraged the colonists to form their own independent government. Meeting privately, as their acts would be considered treasonous, a declaration committee was formed from the Continental Congress of five men with the task of putting together a protest document. Thomas Jefferson, the group's youngest member, was given the task of writing this document. In his now famous writings, Jefferson quotes thinkers such as John Locke and George Mason, and using terms like unalienable rights, to declare what he believed the colonists deserved and their independence from the British crown. Upon achieving their independence, the 13 former British colonies set to work on their first written constitution. They called this the Articles of Confederation, in which they set up a confederation that would give strong state sovereignty and limit the power of the national government. The Articles of Confederation, however, would unravel very quickly due to a series of institutional weaknesses, the first of which being that the Congress had no power to levy or collect taxes. This left the government with a huge shortage of money and an inability to raise a militia. The second was that the Congress had no power to regulate trade, which created quarrels between the states in their efforts to get a leg up in trade. Third, Congress had no power to enforce its laws, leaving the states largely responsible for enforcing all of the laws. And finally, it took nine of the 13 states to enact a law, making the process far too complicated. In general, a central government that was far too weak was the biggest problem with the Articles of Confederation. Consequently, the event that would spell the demise of the Articles of Confederation was Shays' Rebellion in 1787. Daniel Shays, a former Revolutionary War hero, led a revolt of farmers in the New England colonies who were protesting the high taxes and foreclosures that were being placed on their farms. In the end, the federal government was not able to put down the rebellion quickly, and much blood was shed, proving that the weaknesses in the Articles of Confederation were too much to overcome, as the federal government did not have the ability to put down the rebellion in a timely manner. In response to the overwhelming weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation pointed out most exclusively by Shays' Rebellion, members from all states except for Rhode Island sent delegates to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. Their original purpose was simply to modify or strengthen the Articles, but it became quickly apparent that a new Constitution would be necessary. Each of the delegates had several agreements, including the need for a three-branch system with checks and balances, a stronger executive, and a stronger independent judiciary. However, disagreements occurred over several issues, including how would representation be divvied up in the legislature, what would be the future of slavery in America, and how would the power of trade be settled. The issue of representation in the legislature was perhaps the most heated topic of contention at the Constitutional Convention. The first plan proposed was by Edmund Randolph of Virginia, who wanted a legislature that was based on the premise of population. This, of course, favored larger states like Virginia. William Patterson of New Jersey, however, proposed an alternate plan in which every state's number of seats in the legislature would be equally based with no regard to its population. It took Roger Sherman of Connecticut to come to what we now know as the Great Compromise. It divided our Congress into two houses, also known as bicameralism. The House of Representatives, the lower house, would be based on population, while the upper house, the Senate, would give each state two elected members. With it now agreed upon that the House of Representatives would be based on population, the southern states set to work in counting their slaves as part of their population in an attempt to boost their representation. The North, meanwhile, wanting to prevent the expansion of slavery, did not want slaves to be counted, and as it would also limit the South and their representation in Congress. The two sides finally reached an agreement known as the Three-Fifths Compromise. In this compromise, each slave would be counted as three-fifths of a white man. This would limit the South's representation in the House of Representatives, but in the meantime prevent civil war. The issue of trade was also finally put to bed by the Constitution. 
as in Article I of the Constitution, the power to regulate foreign and interstate commerce was explicitly given to the United States Congress. In future decades, this would be challenged in a case known as Gibbons v. Ogden, in which the Court reaffirmed that the power to regulate trade lied in the hands of Congress. Overall, the United States Constitution helped clear up many of the weaknesses that had previously existed in the Articles of Confederation by creating a stronger federal government with a stronger legislature, president, and a uniform system of checks and balances. Following the Constitutional Convention, the delegates from each state return home, understanding that 9 out of 13 state legislatures would need to vote on the approval and ratification of the Constitution. Immediately, factions formed over the writing of this original document. The Federalists were those who believed in the original draft of the Constitution and favored a stronger federal government. They argued that a Bill of Rights was not necessary because federal power was already going to be limited by state constitutions. The Anti-Federalists, on the other hand, feared that state sovereignty would be taken over by a federal government that would be too strong. They opposed the ratification of the original document and wanted a Bill of Rights put in so that they knew their exact liberties and rights. Finally, a compromise was reached in which James Madison wrote the first ten amendments of the Constitution that we now call the Bill of Rights. In an attempt to persuade their state legislatures to ratify the Constitution, several prominent founding fathers including Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison, the author of the Constitution, set to work on writing a series of essays known as the Federalist Papers. Perhaps the most famous of these was Federalist No. 10, in which Madison wrote that factions in our country were inevitable, but he believed that they were controllable by the establishment of a strong republic. In using the term republic, Madison wanted to make it clear which form of democracy he felt would be most efficient for America moving forward. Democracy actually comes in two specific forms. A direct democracy is a system in which every single citizen has a direct vote on the policies and laws that are passed. This is just not practical or even possible considering the large volumes of people and populations that exist today. A representative democracy, also known as a republic, is a system in which the citizens vote on people to be their own representatives and vote for policies on their behalf. This system was used in ancient Rome and has now been adopted here in the United States. As the opening paragraph of the U.S. Constitution, the preamble states the six goals that the new republic hopes to achieve, forming a more perfect union, establishing justice, ensuring domestic tranquility or peace at home, providing for a common defense or military, promoting the general welfare and health of the public, and securing our blessings of liberty and choice. Following the preamble, our Constitution then goes on to organize our government through the use of seven articles, the first three of which organize the three branches of government that we know well today. The founders made a very deliberate choice to make the legislative branch the first article and the longest of which to send the message that the legislature would be the dominant branch of American government. The establishment of three distinct branches of government makes the system of separation of powers that we know today possible. Separation of powers lies in the fact that each branch of government should give it, be given a separate responsibility to carry out. The legislative branch, or Congress, comprised of the House of Representatives and the Senate, is responsible for making our laws. The executive branch, which is fronted by the President of the United States, along with the Vice President and Cabinet, are responsible for enforcing or carrying out the laws. And finally, the judicial branch, headed by the U.S. Supreme Court, but including lower federal courts, is responsible for interpreting or evaluating the law. The concept of checks and balances is perhaps the most important in the U.S. Constitution. The idea of checks and balances holds that no one branch should become too powerful, as each branch is able to do something to the others to counteract their powers. Take for example the executive branch. The president is able to check the Congress by proposing policies that he sees fit, and by vetoing bills that have been passed by Congress that he believes are not good for the country. The president can also check the judicial branch by appointing federal judges who he believes should hold a seat, and by using his power of pardon to excuse criminals who have been convicted of federal offenses in which the President believes they did not receive a fair trial. Next take Congress. Congress can check the President by overriding his veto with a two-thirds vote in both houses. The Senate has the ability to confirm any appointments he makes to his cabinet or to the courts, as well as the ability to ratify the treaties that he enters into with other foreign heads of state. They also have the ability to control the passing of the budget that the President proposes each year. Congress can also check the judicial branch by creating lower federal courts, changing their jurisdictions, impeaching or removing judges, and the Senate has the ability to confirm the appointments of the court that the President makes. 
The court's power is pretty much uniform in both cases. The Supreme Court can use its power of judicial review to declare acts of Congress or the President as unconstitutional. Article 4 of the Constitution was designed to talk about the relationships between the states. This article is known best for the creation of what is known as the Full Faith and Credit Clause. The Full Faith and Credit Clause says that each state must honor the public acts, records, and proceedings of every other state. This includes any acts of marriage or divorce, or any financial establishments or foreclosures that may exist on someone's financial records. Our Founding Fathers were wise enough to realize that many issues would come up in the future that the Constitution would just not be built to be able to handle. Thus, in Article 5, they created the amendment process. It is the reason why many today consider the Constitution a living document, because it can be altered or amended at any time. The Constitution lists two ways in which an amendment can be added to the Constitution, the most popular of which calls for a proposal by two-thirds of both houses of Congress and ratification then by three-quarters of the state legislatures. There is, however, a second method that uses the convention process. This method is not used commonly and was used only once to repeal an amendment as the Prohibition Amendment was repealed in Amendment 21. The final section of the U.S. Constitution is the amendments. They include the first ten written by Madison, known as the Bill of Rights. The amendments inside the Bill of Rights that AP U.S. government students would need to know intimately include Amendment 1, Amendment 4, Amendment 5, which along with the Due Process Clause and the Protection from Self-Incrimination includes protection from double jeopardy, Amendment 6, which along with the Speedy and Public Trial Clause also includes the right to an attorney, and Amendment 10, which says that the powers not delegated to the U.S. government through the Constitution are reserved to the individual states. Outside of the Bill of Rights, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution are also very significant for AP U.S. government students to know. The 13th Amendment officially abolished slavery in this country, while the 14th Amendment clarified issues left in the Dred Scott case by clearly defining citizenship and granting equal protection under the law for all citizens. Finally, the 15th Amendment granted African American males full suffrage rights. Along with understanding that the 15th Amendment gave African American men full suffrage rights, AP government students also need to understand three other very important suffrage-based amendments. The 19th Amendment gave women universal suffrage, while the 24th Amendment abolished poll taxes as a requirement to vote. Finally, the 26th Amendment gave all Americans age 18 or older the right to vote. Along with understanding separation of powers and checks and balances, federalism is the other most important principle of the U.S. Constitution that AP U.S. government students need to understand. Federalism differs from the system that many countries in the world use, known as a unitary system. In a unitary system, only the national government is called for in the Constitution. Any state, local, or municipal governments are given their powers only by that which is handed down by the national government. Federalism, however, which is used here in the United States, includes multiple levels of government that each have their own distinct powers and also are able to share some powers. The idea of federalism is that each level of government should have its own distinct set of responsibilities or powers. Take, for example, the national government. Its enumerated or delegated powers include the power to declare war, negotiate treaties, issue money, and regulate trade. On the other hand, the states have what is known as reserve powers, things like regulating education, granting marriage licenses or driver's licenses, and providing police forces and fire protection. There are some powers that are shared by both the national and state governments, and they are known as concurrent powers, the most prominent of which is being able to levy income taxes. There are, however, some powers that are expressly denied to the United States Congress through our Constitution the first of which is being able to suspend what is known as the writ of habeas corpus. This would be a clear violation of due process rights in which the government could detain an innocent person simply based on accusations without the use of a trial. The other would be the passage of what is known as ex post facto laws. This would be passing a law and then enforcing that law retroactively by punishing someone who committed the crime when the crime was not actually considered illegal at the time. Though we are considered a federal system, Article 6 of the Constitution makes it very clear that whenever federal and state statutes conflict, the federal government will always be the most powerful level. Known as the Supremacy Clause, Article 6 of the Constitution clearly states that the national government is to be the supreme law of the land. 
This means that any actions taken by the states cannot override or contradict policies that have already been taken on by the federal government. The first and most infamous tests of the Supremacy Clause came in the 1819 Supreme Court case of McCullough v. Maryland. In the case, the state of Maryland attempted to tax the First National Bank of the United States after it set up shop in Maryland. The state of Maryland feared that the presence of this bank would create competition for its own state-owned banks. The federal government filed a suit with the Supreme Court stating that it did not believe that it had to pay taxes to an individual state. In the end, John Marshall and his Supreme Court ruled that the Supremacy Clause prevented any state from having the ability to tax the national government. They also cited that the Necessary and Proper Clause, or Elastic Clause, in Article I of the Constitution did give Congress the authority to create this national bank. Perhaps the most controversial part of the Constitution is the Necessary and Proper Clause. In Article I of the Constitution, which lists the powers of Congress, it states that the Congress has the right to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution. This has allowed Congress to expand its power in many situations in the coming years. Thus it has gotten its title, the Elastic Clause. I hope that this presentation has been able to refresh your memory and help get you a strong overview of the first unit of AP U.S. Government and Politics. I wish you the best of luck on the AP exam in May.